Well, today we continue our series, which we've called Focus. We often need to be reminded about focus and where to focus because it's easy to get distracted with so much going on in the world and in our lives today. There are different directions that God has called us to and calls our attention to, directions that we need to be aware of as individuals and as a church. We've heard and no doubt experienced much of the instability the last couple of years has dished out. In regards to the church, we know that the worldwide pandemic accelerated trends that had been slowly inching forward prior to 2020. For example, people's connection to church, not just this church, uh, but every church, those connections seem to have loosened for some people. The influence of religion in people's lives took a nosedive, as highlighted by the 2021 census. And for the first time in Australia's history, the number of people identifying as Christian dropped below 50%. For the first time in Toowoomba's history, our city, the buckle of Australia's Bible Belt, the no religion was the top ticked response. Church leaders here and around the world are realising that in order to address this trend, changes need to occur. The message must stay the same, but the method is going to need some work. The good news of Jesus has not changed but to reach a world whose back is increasingly turning away from the church, our approach needs to be carefully and wisely considered. Our approach begins by looking to the cross. This is where our series began with Ross reminding us of our need to follow Jesus' example of humility, ultimately displayed on a cross. We are to set aside our own interests to consider God's interests and the interests of others. From that place of humility, we acknowledge that God is God and I am not. Through his death on the cross, Jesus restored our relationship with God. And so we look up and in faith, we rely on his strength, his direction and his peace. We lean into his word, the Bible. We need God's help. In Jenny's message a couple of weeks ago, we were reminded to look around, to look around at those on the journey with us and do the hard work of getting along. Unity matters to God. And the way in which we love one another says a lot about what we think about God. And it's not just about getting along with others as individuals. It's about churches getting along with other churches and Christian organizations, supporting one another, praying for one another. Just in this last couple of weeks, a number of churches of Christ from around our region gathered together for prayer and to hear each other's stories. We continued our partnership with six other churches here in town for the winter shelter for the homeless. Last Sunday, we heard of God at work through the connection that we have with churches and Christian organizations in Uganda. We host a city women event here on Tuesday morning, and each Sunday we are committed to praying for another Toowoomba church community. Our focus today will be the way that God calls us to look back. Again, it begins by looking to the cross, being humble, following Jesus' example. And from there, we look up, seeking God's guidance in how best to approach his call to look back. We also consider those on the journey with us as we look around. What does looking back together look like? One way of looking back is in the context of history. And it's often helpful to think of history as a line. The thing to remember about a timeline is that time is always moving forward. And there is a very real danger of getting stuck at a particular point if we're not careful. Whenever we look back, we must also remember that we are also to look ahead. 
which is what Jackson will be speaking about in next week's message. So let's take a look at some of these sticky points on a timeline. The first is when we rely too heavily on past achievements. Past achievements were perfect for that particular point on the timeline. They provided the opportunity for another step forward. We can learn from our past achievements. We can be thankful, but we can't get stuck there. Our goal is not where we've been or what we've done. The Apostle Paul highlighted this sticky point in his letter to the early church in Philippi. Paul was a highly decorated Jew, followed the religious law to a T, but here's what he writes in Philippians 3. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. Now he's referring to all his past achievements. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Closely connected to the trap of past achievement is the perilous attraction of nostalgia. Ah, the good old days. The siren song of longing for the way things used to be. And it doesn't take a whole lot of effort to be instantly transported off track down memory lane with a song, a movie, a smell, a photo. I mean, it's wonderful to have fond memories of days gone by. But the problem, the problem is that they're often a lot more perfect in our imagination than the actual event was. We become seduced by our selective recollections and spin our fanciful story like a broken record. Records. You remember records? Black, shiny vinyl. Hang on, I'm off. Hang on. I'm back on track. As, as we look back, as we look back, we've got to remember that the line is still moving forward. God has already done what he's needed to do in the past, and he is still at work right now, ready for us to respond to his leading in this moment. The writer of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament reminds us that there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the, under the heavens. Ecclesiastes also warns about lingering too long on yesterday. We read in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 10, Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. When God spoke through the prophet Isaiah, he said, Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And then the song the psalmist wrote, recorded in chapter 118 of Psalms, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, if you're my age or older, who remembers that song? Number 40 in the Brown Scripture and Songbook. Oh, yeah, those were the days, hey? Why don't we sing those songs anymore? Yeah. Wait, hang on. We're doing it again. Thirdly, when we look back down the timeline, there are those things in life that we wish we hadn't done or should have done or hadn't said or should have said. Sometimes the mountain of regret prevents us from seeing the road ahead. But when we look back through the lens of Jesus' work on the cross, we're reminded that there is forgiveness for sin. There is freedom from shame. There is a way forward. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. Whilst the track back through history can have its pitfalls, there is also much to be gained in the search for wisdom. Contrary to common belief in much of society today, the world did exist before 2015. And important things happen that are still relevant and still can be learned from. Who we are today has a lot to do 
with where we've come from. We read in the Old Testament that God initiated festivals and feasts and special days and inspired songs to help his people remember who they were, where they'd come from, and their value to God. In October this year, we will be celebrating 140 years as a faith community here at Hume Ridge. An encouragement in looking back is knowing that we're, that what we're part of here is not some flash in the pan, blink and you'll miss it kind of movement. It's a reminder of the faithfulness of those who have gone before, those who have walked the long road of obedience in the same direction. It's a reminder that no matter what point of history that we're living in, God is faithful from generation to generation. We are part of his story, growing God's kingdom for his glory. As he speaks about the growth of the church, the Apostle Paul wrote, The Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. This leads nicely into another perspective of how we might understand what it means to look back. But to set it up, we must again begin by looking to the cross. When we look to the cross, we see Jesus' example of humility. The humble king of heaven, who did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. The humble king, who came not to be served, but to serve. The humble king who looked back and reached out and saved us from death. We were separated from God because of sin, choosing our way over God's way. God sent Jesus to take the punishment for our sin on the cross, which bridged the gap of separation, providing the only way back into relationship with him. Nothing we could do could make that possible. Being a good person and doing nice things for people won't cut it. It's all grace. It's all grace from God. And all we're asked to do is believe it. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Grace is an undeserved free gift. It doesn't expect us to make the giant leap to win approval or acceptance. Grace looks back and meets us right where we're at and smooths the way forward for our next step forward. Now, here is some hard truth. God owes us nothing. We are entitled to nothing, but God loves us. God is generous. He gives us more than we need and more than we deserve. Everything that has got us to, our, to this point right now is by God's grace. The fact that we're even breathing right now is because of God's grace. Everything that we have, our time, our talent, our treasure, is a gift of grace from God. And that gift of grace is going to look different in different people. But that's the idea. To each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. So let's try a fun little exercise now. I'm going to ask four questions and you can decide on the answers. You don't have to answer out loud. Now, some answers will be factual and objective. Others a little more subjective, more of your own opinion. But there'll be questions about you. Now, I'm going to give you a line starting at zero, ending in 100. And your job is to imagine a mark or a dot on that line as to where you think you are. So, so question one is going to be related to time. 
And this particular aspect of time, I'm going to ask you how old you are. All right, can you see on that line where your age might be? Now, have a think about what are some of the advantages of being your age right now? Some of the good things about being however old you are right now. Okay. Question two. Think of something that you're good at. What you are good at. And between 1 and 100, rate yourself. Zero is someone who has no clue, and 100 is someone who is awesome. Now, you might be a good driver, a good builder, a good cook. You might be technologically savvy. You might be a good poet, a good gardener, a good listener. Whatever you're good at, put a mark on the line as to where you think you are. Question number three. In between zero and 100, rate where you think you sit in relation to others when it comes to your income and what you own. This might be helpful. Elon Musk is currently earning north of $200 billion this year. So he's probably more this end. <laughs> so this might also be helpful. The average Australian earns $91,000 a year. According to the world's rich list, this makes the average Australian richer than 93% of the world's population. If you earn a third of that amount, so around $30,000, you're still sitting in the top quarter of the world's population, so from about 75 and up. So mark on that line where you think you are. Question number four. A question primarily for the Christians here, but if you're not a Christian, you can still answer this question. If this line represents your faith journey, or to be more specific, your spiritual maturity, where do you sit? Zero is you want nothing to do with Jesus at all. Around 50 is probably the mark where you decided to make that decision to follow Jesus. And then 100 is like people can't tell the difference between you and Jesus. You are just, you are perfect. <laughs> you know your Bible backwards. Okay, so we'll come back to your answers in just a moment. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells a parable of the talents to reveal that God expects us to put to work what he has given us to use. Each of the three servants in the parable are given different amounts. But the point of the story is not how much they were given, it's what they did with what they were given. You have been given more of some things than other people and in other things less. And as a church, we have been given more of some things than others, and in other things, less. What we have is important, but more important is what we're doing with it. The Apostle Peter writes this, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And in the words of Jesus, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Okay, back to your answers to those four questions. Here's what I'd like you to think about. On each of those lines where you've marked a dot, that represents the portion of God's grace you believe you've been given in relation to those things. On that same line, there is another dot, perhaps many dots, that are not you. Those dots are all to the left of your dot. They are people further down the line to where you're at. The space between you and whoever those other dots represent is the grace you've been given to use. It's the distance that you travel to meet people where they're at. It's the window of opportunity that we have to look back and bring them with us on the journey by walking beside them, not expecting them to jump to where we are. Our role is to warm them to the experience of grace, which comes from the overflow of grace already given to us by God so that they might take the next step forward, closer to Jesus. 
And just like in the parable of the talents, the one who gifted the talents will ask us to account for what we've been given by him. So now is not the time to shy away and think that what you've, good at, that what you've got isn't good enough for what God wants you to do. Now, I think this is where the concept of humility has been twisted to mean something that it's not. Stepping back from a God-given responsibility is not humility. It's false humility, which is actually pride in disguise. C.S. Lewis noted this. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. False humility is when we intentionally devalue ourselves or our contributions in an, att- in an attempt to appear humble. And it's used all the time in churches. I just don't think vacuuming is my gifting. Now, let's be honest. False humility comes in very handy when we're asked to do things that we don't want to do. But it's not good. Admittedly, a lot of false humility comes from a place of fear. But Jesus didn't come to make us safe. He came to make us brave. He wants you to, he wants you to know who you are. And all that he has given you is for such a time as this. And that's for all of us. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. The grace that God has given you, the gifts that he has given you, is not about you. God has blessed us with time, talent, and treasure, and a reason for our faith so that we may bless others. As we look back, God's generous gift of grace and love for us is reflected to others. And in the process, we are blessed. God is blessed. It's it's win, win, win all around. It's great. As Jesus was sending out his disciples, he reminded them, freely you have received. Now, freely give. Looking back is not just about doing nice things for people. It's about inspiring people to look ahead, toward the hope that we have because of what Jesus has done for us. The greatest encouragement to our faith comes from looking back. It's in, it's in looking back as individuals and as a church that we see God's great faithfulness. We see him using the broken road that we've walked on to bring us to where we are right now. And right now, he is still at work in everything that we choose to surrender to him. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. As I close, I want to close with the last verse of Psalm 23 that well-known, that well-loved psalm. The last verse of Psalm 23 echoes this truth that we've been talking about this morning. It tells of what to expect when we look back over our lives through the lens of the cross. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And then as we turn around to face the future, the cross still firmly fixed in our field of vision, the psalmist ends by highlighting the hope that we hold to, our eternal destination guaranteed because of an overwhelming, overflowing gift of grace. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace. Thank you that you looked back and lifted us out of the mess that we were in and provided the way for a new and eternal life with you. We thank you for Jesus and his example of humility that we follow. Help us not to be consumed with ourselves and our own interests, 
but to be aware of those that we can extend grace to so that they may experience a taste of how abundantly gracious you are. We give thanks for every blessing. Help us to be wise and generous with all you've provided so that in all we do and then all we say, you would be glorified. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.